this week on the Back Table Podcast. And I'll be honest, when we started and I told Riyadh I wanted to do this for prostate cancer, he's like, okay, dog, whatever <laughs> you think, but I, I don't know about this. And so he's one ulcer and that's it. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's, that's fair. That's, that's true. Let me just try this out. And so he supported me 100% and he was very shocked and surprised that things worked as well as they did. And I think everybody has been. And so that's what's really been driving it forward. So it's really that quest to improve patient care in whatever avenue that might be. Welcome to the Back Table Podcast, which is committed to all things IR and endovascular. This is Michael Barraza returning as your host, recording today in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. If you're a new listener, welcome to our regular listeners. Welcome back and thank you for listening. You can find all of our previous episodes on Spotify, iTunes, or pretty much anywhere else you get your podcasts. And please check out our web app and let us know what we can do to make it more useful for you. To kick off today's episode, I'd like to thank our sponsor, RadPad. RadPad was developed by physicians for physicians, providing clinically proven radiation protection during CINI and digital subtraction angiography. Don't bet your career or your health on anything less. Trust RadPad radiation protection shields for all your fluoro-guided interventions. See radpad.com for more information. Contact info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and a no-brainer radiation protection cap. And let them know you heard about it on the Back Table podcast. To get things started today, we're going to talk about Y90 for prostate cancer. And joining me today are Sonny Bagla and Sam Mooley. Thank you guys for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us. I think Sonny is going to be leading a lot of this. One of the things I just want to start out with, or for you, Sam, first of all, for those of us that don't know you, tell us where you are and tell us how you got started doing this and why prostate cancer. Sure. So I'm at uh, Northwestern uh, in the IR department there, and we're a big Y90 shop. So it's only a matter of time before we try to put it somewhere else that wasn't the liver. We have a really big prostate embolization practice for BPH. Took a lot of what we learned from Sunny and Ari and tried to apply here in Chicago. And what we found is a lot of patients that have come to us have been interested if this was a potential solution for prostate cancer. And obviously, Bland embolization, there's a lot of data on this, doesn't really do anything for prostate cancer. So we were trying to explore new options and naturally Y90 seemed like a good idea. So that's what the the genesis of this idea was. And uh, we've been working on it for the last about three or four years in a preclinical model. And we're getting ready to translate that to a first in man clinical trial, ideally January, 2021. Mike, I would be remiss to say that, as you guys know, Sam and Riyadh and Bobby Lewandowski are all at Northwestern. These guys want to use Y90, I think, for impotence, for brain tumors, <laughs> for non-healing ulcers. So this was a natural leap for them. But Sam, I want to ask you a question about that. Prostate cancer has such a high benchmark for success. As we know from the existing literature in prostate cancer, recurrence rates are very low for focal therapy whether it's for local control. And I think when we're looking at applying a new technology, say Y90 to prostate cancer, with the data from say IMRT or existing brachytherapy where the recurrence rates are so low, how do you feel that this was something to actually just jump on? Because it's obviously a daunting task to say, I'm going to take a disease where survival rates are so good, but I'm going to try and offer something that actually may be even better because the benchmark, it's really high to get to that point. That's a great question. So in 2016, in New England Journal, they published the results of the PROTECT trial, which is a randomized control trial, about 1,700 patients comparing watchful waiting to surgery to radiotherapy. And obviously, what you would expect in watchful waiting, patients did poorly compared to the other two arms. However, in the surgery and radiation arms, there was no difference in prostate cancer-specific mortality, overall mortality, or metastases. So if surgery and radiation are equivalent, what was really driving patients' treatment selection? And that was really looking at the side effect profile. And so where we currently stand, they're pretty significant in both arms. With surgery, you might deal with incontinence and erectile dysfunction. With radiation as it currently exists, there's radiation damage to the bladder, also to the erectile tissues, also to the rectum. And so a patient has to make this risks benefits analysis themselves and decide what side effect profile they can live with. And interestingly enough, there's been a lot of patient reported healthcare questionnaires that they've done regarding this data set. And up to 60% of men regret the treatment choices they've made with regards to their prostate cancer. So there's definitely room for improvement. 
And rather than a cancer control standpoint, it's really if we can generate something with a better side effect profile and fewer adverse events for these patients. That's good. My understanding is that obviously a lot of these side effects are obviously dose limited, right? Whether it's IMRT and you're getting a dose, not just obviously to prostatic tissue, but to the surrounding organs. And then with brachytherapy, we're say they're delivering on average, I don't know, 70 gray or 70 to 80 gray. Do you feel as if this would allow, because it's a local directed therapy, a side effect profile that maybe fit between those two options of IMRT or brachytherapy? Or do you think it actually might be better than both options? I'm hoping that it'll be better. So when we started this a few years ago, we really didn't know what was going to happen when we did this study in the animals, if it was going to completely necrose everything or explode the pelvis. And the radiation damage from the current radiotherapies, if a patient needs a salvage prostatectomy or something along those lines, it's usually a very hostile admin. So we didn't want to generate something like that. So we did a dose escalation study starting at 60 gray going up to 120. And we did not see any off-target effects because we were using coil embolization, cone beam CT, all the typical things you use during regular BPH-driven prostate artery embolization and all the microcatheter work. And the radiation, due to the physical characteristics of Y90, really stays within the prostate gland, doesn't extend into the surrounding tissue. So you don't see radiation damage to the erectile nerves, the rectum, the bladder, the penile soft tissues. And we have pathology that we've done on all of these study animals showing that, confirming that there has been no radiation damage anywhere outside prostate. The idea would be dose escalation within the prostate gland, really limiting the off-target effects, very similar to what we've seen already in the liver with a steep drop-off of the radiation away from the microsphere. Okay. So in this animal study that you guys completed, because we didn't really get too much into that yet, what was the primary goal? Was it just to demonstrate that it's feasible to even deliver Y90 into the prostate? Was it, let's create a model for future study? What was really the primary goal? And then maybe some secondary goals you can share with us when you guys designed the study there at Northwestern. So interestingly enough, there was a paper written in the radiation oncology literature, I think about 10 years ago, that said the ideal radioisotope for prostate cancer treatment is Y90. And they wrote this whole theoretical nuclear science paper about this. And they're like, if only there was a way to deliver Y90 to the prostate. That's where they ended it. <laughs> yeah. And and what was so, this? That's probably plastered this, all over the locker room at Northwestern Iowa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This was probably about 10 years ago. And so they're just like one of those things in medicine where one hand doesn't talk to the other. And so very early on in brachytherapy, they were using radioisotopes similar to Y90, but not exactly the same. But they found that making seeds with this kind of level of activity and implanting them, you're getting a high dose to the operator, to the staff. So it just wasn't safe. So they've changed the different things that they use currently, like iodine and such that are safer to handle. But if we can deliver it through a microcatheter, we don't have to worry about all those things. So it was actually the ideal isotope to begin with, but nobody had ever really studied it with the current delivery platform that we have. So what we did was we took a animal model of prostate embolization that was used in the early literature to show that it was safe for BPH. And we adapted that to use for this model. All we wanted to do is prove safety because we already knew that radiotherapy for prostate cancer is a standard of care and well accepted. It kills the cancer cells. Everybody knows that. So we just wanted to show that we could deliver it technically, as you mentioned, and also safely without off-target effects to all of the surrounding tissues. And so in about 20 study animals, we were able to catheterize the prostatic artery on one side, the other side being a control, and then deliver escalating doses of Y90 microspheres to the prostatic tissues. And then looking at the long-term effects up to three months after the procedure and looking for urinary complications, rectal complications, and then any ulcers anywhere or erectile dysfunction issues and things like that, which is a little bit weird to look at in a dog, but that's what we did. And what we found, surprisingly enough, is there hasn't been any issues with off-target radiation damage to the surrounding tissues, which was confirmed, as I mentioned, on PATH and PET MRI. The urinary and bowel function remained intact, and it was really just beads localized to the tissue that we treated, which was exactly what you want to see. We had to go in these animals, and you're using two French microcatheters and microcoils and cone beam CT and all the techniques that you would do with a clinical case in BPH and applying them for prostate cancer. And so as long as you maintain that meticulous technique, 
the results look very promising, enough so that we're really excited to push this forward into a clinical trial as soon as we can to study it in patients. And do these on animals. One of my questions is how do you get consistency in the dose when we're doing prostates for BPH? It seems to be very variable how much embolic you can get into the prostate. Did you see much stasis in these when you were treating them? That's a great question. So the platform we're using is Boston Scientific's Therosphere platform. So the nice thing about Therosphere is it's 40 micron spheres. It's not embolic in nature. So you do all your regular dose calculations for a volume-based dosimetry single compartment model. So we basically say the prostate is approximately 40, 50 grams. In these dogs, we're treating half, so 25. What is the dose that we need to deliver to 25 grams of tissue to get 70 gray, 80 gray up to 120? And then when you deliver that dose, it's not embolic. So it's really just sitting in the prostate. It's not right. spilling over anywhere else. And you're not reaching stasis, which works in our favor here. Are there any anatomical considerations, Sam? Obviously, in the dog model, the vascular anatomy may be somewhat different than in a human. So what's maybe the biggest challenge or difference you've seen? Something that maybe made the procedure easier or harder, I'd say? I'd say the vessels are very small. So everything is, we do a four French base catheter which is like a baby sauce that we use to get from the aorta into the iliac. And then everything else after that is microcatheter work. And so these are basically a two French microcatheter is essentially occlusive in these prostatic arteries, which is similar to humans. However, there are also collaterals to the bladder, to the rectum. Dogs have anal glands, as I'm sure you might remember. And so these are things that need to be coil embolized prior to proceeding. And that made it a little bit challenging to deliver all these coils in those locations and to deliver it safely. But besides that, I would almost argue that doing it in canine model is probably easier than doing it in a person because (laughs) there's no atherosclerosis, that there's not a lot of tortuosity. It's all a bunch of straight lines for the most part. So other than the size difference, it's actually pretty straightforward to the point that we were doing, we were able to get done with the case within 30 minutes towards the end of the study. I would also be silly to not bring up COVID at some point during this podcast, Mike. So <laughs> I'm going to say it's already challenging enough to do research. It's probably even more challenging to do it in animals, especially at a big institution. But I'm sure you ran into some challenges with respect to the pandemic and doing clinical research, especially in animals at Northwestern during this time. Did you guys, it's a little bit off topic, but somewhat in parallel. How did you guys deal with these challenges in terms of doing study subjects, if you will, during this time? That's a great question. So the original timelines for the study, we were anticipating being done with everything early spring and then getting all the clinical trial stuff together to start in the fall. However, because of COVID, there was a hard stop in March. And so we had to wait until just a few weeks ago to complete all the animal studies. And so it's subsequently pushed everything out six months. University, luckily, saw the value of the research and the importance of it. So they gave us a special exemption to continue after the long discussions and ensuring there was a safety protocol in place that met everybody's requirements, not just for the practitioners, but also the veterinary staff and the animals themselves. So as much as we could, we minimize risk and exposure to complete the study safely. I would love to think that this is going to replace or at least work in parallel with the existing definitive therapy, say for prostate cancer. But getting back to where we started in the beginning, do you think that when you take this to the the clinical research study in humans, for example, that you're going to be looking more as at salvage patients rather than first line treatment, primarily because maybe an easier benchmark to cross? Or how, how do you guys plan on rolling this out? I think in humans, I'd be interested to hear about that. Yeah, so that's a great question. So the first couple of times we were thinking about this, that's obviously the situation in which you don't want to show a delta, so to speak. If you have to get into the salvage setting, it's very difficult to show signal. However, the prostate cancer is a very interesting space in that there are a lot of new therapies that are being offered that patients gravitate towards, even if the data is limited, because the side effect profile of the existing therapies is quality of life is very compromised with what's available currently. That's why things like cryo, HIFU, other focal therapies, IRE, patients with otherwise resectable disease are opting to try these out because they're looking for something that's potentially better in terms of their sexual function and urinary function and GI function following treatment. And so 
I think, and my hope is to offer this as a primary therapy from the get-go, knowing that radiotherapy is accepted in this space and there are current limitations to radiotherapy. And what I mean by that is if a prostate is greater than 60 grams in size, and as I'm sure all of you guys know who do PAE, that's very common, patients are not a candidate for radiotherapy right off the bat. What they need to get in lieu of that is androgen deprivation for three to six months to shrink down their gland, and then they can get radiotherapy. And with androgen deprivation, basically, there's a lot of side effects, as you can imagine, sexual side effects, quality of life side effects, but also cardiovascular risks from all that androgen deprivation. So if we can obviate that need, just start out with big prostates with prostate cancer, that would be ideal for catheterization. That's where we would like to take it to begin with. And that's what we're working towards in, our, in terms of our study design. The patients who come for prostate cancer therapies in general, and BPH is also very similar, is as a group, very well-educated, very savvy, and they're looking for these novel therapies. And so I don't, and this might be wishful thinking, I don't anticipate that it'll be that difficult to recruit patients because they're still searching for something that is elusive to them in terms of the ideal therapy with the ideal side effect profile. Sure. In looking at this, how are you guys approaching patient selection when you're looking at the human studies? Yeah. So what we're looking for is unresectable disease. So that's in the staging criteria that would be T2 disease. And then patients with larger prostate glands. So we want your 100 gram prostate, your 80 gram prostate, somebody that's going to be easy to do technically, sure. so to speak. As we've done a couple of studies for BPH already, I think everybody would need to have an MRI just to get an idea of what the anatomy looks like. And we're debating whether or not to add a CTA or MRA to that to look at what the vascular anatomy is. And other than that, I think those are our main selection criteria. We don't want metastatic disease or the salvage patient because, again, it's very difficult to demonstrate benefit or utility in those patients because they're already dealing with a side effect profile from their original therapy. So that might be more challenging. Yeah, it mix up some data in terms of what their side effect profile is, like you mentioned, and that's really potentially the biggest benefit. Correct. I know we've right. touched on this, but you think that's basically what it'll have to show in order to become a real competitor for first-line therapies is efficacy and basically less, fewer side effects than you're getting with radiation therapy or surgery. Correct. So the prostate cancer space, initially, the standard of care was open prostatectomy versus radiotherapy. Hmm. And then that was the standard of care for many years. And more recently, probably the last 15 or 20 years, robotic surgery has really taken off. And if you look at robotic surgery specifically, what are the benefits? There's no difference in cancer-specific mortality or overall mortality or incidence of metastases, et cetera. And the difference between open surgery and robotic surgery was really just the side effect profile. And that's really what drove patients to it. Although there were several papers that were written in the early 2000s saying that there was no benefit to robotic surgery, it's an unnecessary cost, et cetera. And now it's really considered the standard of care. And if you're not doing robotic surgery as a urologist, then you're behind the eight ball. And so I would imagine that it would be the same driving forces for something like this. It's a great point. Those of you guys who don't know, I'm not sure, Aaron, Mike, if you guys know this well, but Sam did three years of urology training yeah, before he went into interventional radiology. And I'm going to ask you a more of a personal question, Sam. Is this your attraction to the urologic IR space in prostate cancer? Or is this some other personal motivation to why you seek interest in this? Because it's doing research is a passion more than it is anything else. And I'm just curious to know how you feel about that from a personal standpoint. That's a great question. When we started, and this goes all the way back to when we started doing PAE at, at Northwestern, and this was like 2012, 2013, and I really came into IR thinking I would never, ever have to use any of my urology knowledge again, you know, outside like nephrostomy tubes or something like that. And so I remember sitting with Riyadh and doing the first PAEs and we were getting used to cone beam and like figuring out what the anatomy was. And we'd look at something and we'd be like, where's that going? Is that the rectum? Is that the penis? What, what is that? And, you know, <laughs> I was like, okay, I can use my skill set. I can use what I learned previously and, and really try to study this a little bit more. And then it went from there. And I remembered issues that I saw when I was in urology training with the current therapies. I was like, there's a lot that we can do with IR and a lot of questions that we can answer with what we have that we should really look at. And I'll be honest, when we started and I told Riyadh I wanted to do this for prostate cancer, he's like, okay, dog, 
<laughs> whatever you think, but I, I don't know about this. And so he's one ulcer and that's it. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's, that's fair. That's, that's true. Let me just try this out. And so he supported me 100% and he was very shocked and surprised that things worked as well as they did. And I think everybody has been. And so that's what's really been driving it forward. So it's really that quest to improve patient care in whatever avenue that might be. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great story, Sam. And, and knowing Riyadh as well as I do, even with your passion, you have to have a great mentor. And Riyadh's a great mentor when it comes to absolutely educating those younger and really giving them leadership opportunities to really succeed. So it's great you can work in that environment. And I have one more question for you I got that I think is really important is everyone always wants to know. And this with every new thing that we bring, because all IRs are as always excited to apply existing or new technology to new applications is realistically, and I know it's a hard thing to project, if this were to all work out the way you saw it working out, how long would it be before you thought Y90 would actually be used in prostate cancer? I'm hoping for in the next five to 10 years. I think that's probably a conservative estimate. I think there's a lot of interest from Boston Scientific to sponsor studies and new indications for Y90. And there's a lot of utility and there's a lot of interest from our colleagues in other specialties. Surprisingly enough, radiation oncology and surgery and other specialties are interested in improving things. And so they've been very collaborative with us. And so having that kind of collaborative environment is very helpful for pushing this forward. In terms of the technical aspects, I think we need to iron out dosimetry details and things like that. And it's probably going to be a new workflow compared to the current standard with Y90 in the liver. Ideally, we're not doing MAAs on these patients and, and things like that. We're just going straight to therapy. But after having gotten the diagnostic imaging that you need to include or exclude patients. I hope that this is an easier, knock on wood, therapy than bland embolization because you're not going to stasis. You just really need to get into the prosthetic arteries and deliver your therapy and get out. And so hopefully from that standpoint, it will be applicable to a wide audience of both patients and practitioners. And I, I think if you can do PAE, you should be able to do this with the right tools. When you're not doing bland embolization in these, are you seeing fewer collaterals? Or again, I wonder if that'd be hard to distinguish if it's a species-related thing or a workflow-related thing. I don't know. <laughs> so what I've noticed in our BPH practice, and Sonny can chime in on this also, is initially when we were doing these early Y90 experience, we were coiling everything. Like, I don't know if it's going to go there. I'm going to coil that off. And so it was creating a lot of effort to do the therapy. And as we've gotten more and more experience, we've learned that as long as the angiographic findings, like the flow is still towards the prostate rather than out of the prostate when you're doing your runs, then that's like protective inflow, so to speak. And so you don't need to go and chase after all of those collaterals as long as everything is flowing towards the gland. And so we would try to take advantage of those similar scenarios. And obviously, if need be, if something looks like on a cone beam that we need to take care of it, we would take care of it up front. And so the workflow that we've adapted for our BPH practices Patient comes in the room, we do a cone beam CT from the aorta to begin with, see what all the anatomy looks like, see if there are any collaterals. If there are collaterals that need to be embolized, we do those up front and then get into the prostatic arteries and treat. And that simplified our workflow quite a bit. I think Sonny had so much experience with PAE that he can look in an angio and tell you, okay, I need to coil this off. I don't need to coil right. that off. So I think using those techniques, you can do the same for the cancer situation because really in most men, prostate cancer is arising in an enlarged gland. Like probably most of the men that we're treating for PAE have some occult cancer that is brewing in there. And so it's not going to make a huge difference from that standpoint in terms of technical aspects. Leads me to a burning question, even though I know we don't really apply radiotherapy, generally speaking, I would imagine to benign conditions. Is there any reason, Sam, why you would think, and obviously after having done this sort of dose escalation study, that you could think of a reason why this could actually work in a younger man, perhaps with a lower dose, say even half of your lowest dose you are now, to cause enough gland reduction to avoid lower urinary tract symptoms and unrelated to cancer treat men with BPH. Theoretically, I think you could. I don't think we touched on what kind of results we've been getting, so to speak, outside the side effect profile, but very similar to Y90 in the liver, we're seeing profound size changes very rapidly. So we're seeing shrinkage of the glands in the treated side up to 20, 30% after wow. the, you know, a couple weeks, couple weeks of follow-up. 
Well, and it could theoretically be used. I don't know. It's like a risks benefits thing with radiation for benign disease. But I think men with low grade prostate cancer, certainly, which is probably all men after a certain age, would be interested in a therapy like this, assuming that the side effect profile is as favorable as we're hoping it is. No, it's really interesting. And do you obviously, like you mentioned earlier, there's a lot of excitement in the rad onc world, urologic cancer surgery world regarding radio pharmaceuticals in general. With obviously Zofigo, and now I understand that at least over the next, we expect probably six to 12 months to see more exciting data with respect to lutetium, which is a beta particle when a PSMA targeted antigen. Do you think that because radiotherapy is so well accepted with prostate cancer that interventional radiology may not have the hurdle to climb with getting acceptance, like we do, for example, with liver-directed therapy? Yeah, I think it'll be less of an uphill battle because for radiation oncologists, it makes sense in the prostate because they've been doing that for 30 years, as I mentioned. The thing that really blew our colleagues at Northwestern away was when they developed their dose maps, their dose plans for prostate cancer as it currently stands. So they have their ISO dose lines of this is the treatment zone, this is the surrounding tissue. We're going to give 200% of the dose to the treatment zone. The surrounding tissue may get like 150% of the dose, and et cetera, as you extend outwards from where you're treating. And they've just accepted that as part and parcel of the game. It's just, this is what you have to do, and this is what the surrounding damage is going to be like. When you show them what's capable with Y90, with the drop-off, they're very excited by that possibility and the dosimetry potential of the platform. And so I would anticipate that they would be very heavily involved in managing these patients and helping us select the right patients in the follow-up and everything like that. And certainly there's going to be avenues for synergy where a patient might have local disease in the prostate, but also disease elsewhere. We've talked about maybe we treat prostate first, then they clean up the lymph nodes in the area with external beam. Therefore, they don't have to dose as high to the prosthetic tissues and the rectum and the surrounding bladder, et cetera. So when you show them a dose map for PAE with Y90, they're very excited and intrigued by that. That's great to hear. This is very exciting. I can't wait to see where this goes. Is there anything else that we're failing to ask you that you think is important to cover? I think we've hit the major points that we're excited to hopefully bring this to patients in the next year. 2021. And I think that as people are getting more and more acclimated to doing more and more prostates, as Sonny knows, and as you guys know, it's important to be really familiar with the anatomy. And I think as you learn more and more in the benign space, that those same skills will translate to when this is available for an oncologic therapy. And so that's the nice thing about IR and PAE in general is the skill set is adaptable. And that's what makes this exciting and easy to digest from an IR standpoint is something we could potentially offer our patients in the near term. Really appreciate that. That was really insightful. And it's such a cutting edge topic that really nobody else is doing around the world. And so we're glad you and your team, Northwestern, are leading this effort. It's a long road ahead, but it's a really great endeavor you guys are taking on. And Sonny, thank thank you. This is your idea to do this. I wasn't even aware of this. And this is a great topic. And thanks for taking the time to do this. Absolutely. Thank you guys both. And also thank you to our sponsor, RadPad. And thanks for joining us. Thanks, Mike.